this computer. Okay. So good evening and welcome to everyone here. Uh, this is Marise Frangie, the director of CEDAR of Lebanon Fertility Care Center and the NFP coordinator for uh, the Epoche of St. Marin of Brooklyn. I welcome all of you to this uh, series of talks that we are continuing tonight with uh, Professor Janet Smith to celebrate Worldwide Fertility Care Week, and we will launch it tomorrow in Arabic. We're very honored and blessed to have a Professor Janet Smith with us tonight. Before I introduce her, I would like to welcome Bishop Gregory with us uh, and thank him for leading us in prayer shortly. And I want to welcome all the organization directors who are sponsoring this series with me, and Oleg from Fertility Care Center of Rochester, uh, New York, Linda George, the Director of the Office of Family and Sanctity of Life for the Upper Key of St. Maron. Sabdeacon Ernest and his wife Elise Karam, uh, the directors of the Family Life Ministry for the Upper Key of Our Lady of Lebanon, Los Angeles. And I would like to thank Bishop uh, Zaidan and Bishop Gregory for their support of this series. Bishop Gregory, thank you so much for making the time to be with us tonight and for helping us to promote in, uh, this talk. Uh, I will introduce Professor Smith after your uh, opening prayer. Okay. First, may I say thank you to all those people that you mentioned. And I also noticed, also want to one of our deacon, Deacon George, who was on the on the call as well. And I uh, again, I want to thank you, Linda and Maurice, for the good work that you do for our eparchy. And uh, I noticed the sisters are on as well. So yes. And, and Dr. Janet, a special thank you to you for the the witness that you give to the beauty of woman as she is, not as man wants her to be, or sometimes she wants herself to be, to be more uh, acceptable, but as she is, because woman as she is and man as he is, is really a gift from God. So I'm, I thank you for that beautiful witness. So in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Joseph, how did you have such a great attraction for the Virgin Mary and stay chaste? It was more than just self-control. It was a great respect for her personhood and for her promise to God. We thank you also, St. Joseph, for being the man of the family, not in dominating, but in serving, a servant leadership much like that of our Lord Jesus Christ, your foster son. And we thank you, St. Joseph, for not only loving Mary, but for loving the whole church, the church as she We ask you with your prayer and with the prayer of the Virgin Mary and all the saints to guide us, guide Dr. Janet in this conversation and guide all of the listeners who will benefit from this evening. And may we all be able to find what is beautiful in woman and what is beautiful in man and may we give you thanks and glory now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much, Saidna. How beautiful it is that your talk, Professor Smith, end up falling on the feast of St. Joseph and how much we need his intercession for men and women to live their vocation according to God's plan. So, Professor Smith, we're very delighted to have you among us tonight. Uh, Professor Janet Smith is retired from Sacred Heart Major University uh, Seminary in Detroit, Michigan, where she held the Father Michael McGivney Chair of Life Ethics. She is the author of A Humani Vitae, A Generation Later, and A Right to Privacy. Self-Gift is a volume of her already published essays on Humani Vitae and the Thought of John Paul II. She edited Why Humani Vitae is Right, a reader of Life Issues, Medical Choices with Christopher Castro, Living the Truth and Love, Pastoral Approaches to Same-Sex Attractions with Reverend Paul Check, and Why Humani Vitae is Still Right. Professor Smith served three terms as a consultant to the Pontifical Council on the Family and also served as a member of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission for eight years. She writes regularly for uh, the uh, National Catholic Register and for Crisis Magazine. She has received the three honorary doctorates and several other awards for scholarships and service. She has appeared on the Geraldo Shaw Show, Fox Morning News, CNN International, CNN Newsroom, Al Jazeera, and has done many shows on EWTN. More than 2 million copies of her talk, Contraception, Why Not, have been distributed. 
In her retirement, she is helping victims of the priestly sexual abuse crisis and writing on the glories of the traditional mass and trying to finish several scholarly projects. Her materials can be found at janetsmith.org. Free copies of her talks are available there. Following the talk, we will have opportunity for questions uh, which can be typed or can be uh, uh, just said. So without further ado, uh, Professor Janice Smith, we are very excited and we are looking forward to listening to you. As Linda said last week, when you were not with us, you didn't come, you're worth waiting for. So we're really looking forward to hearing you tonight. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. You're, you're very gracious. And again, I'm my apologies to everybody for having just spaced out last Last week, I completely forgot it, but I'm so glad to be here this week and very impressed with the little bit I'm hearing about what you're what you're all doing. Um, it's always remarkable to hear what's going on. Okay, one, I need to, sh can I share? There we yes, go. I made your co-host, you should be able. Yes. I'm, I'm ready to roll here, let's see what happens. Um, Okay, I, I'm speaking on the topic contraception, a woman's friend or foe, which honestly is too narrow a topic. It's really the question is, is it humanity's friend or foe? It's something that has had a very deleterious effect, not just on women, um, but on humanity. Those who were opposed to contraception, you know, back at the time that Humanae Vitae was written or contraception was invented uh, in the in 1960 or so, uh, we made all sorts of predictions about what horrible things would happen if contraception became widely available. But we, we didn't have a clue to a certain extent um, how bad it could, could really get. Um, Reese mentioned a, a blog that I have, um, the Janet e. e. Smith blog. It's just janetsmith.org, I believe. All my, as she mentioned, all my talks are here. If you haven't listened to my talk, uh, Contraception, Why Not? That's sort of a, um, a standard introduction to the topic. There's, I've also got a talk called Hormones or Us. That's, uh, I think it's a great fun. Um, it talks about horm how hormones change the physiology of men in the pill, in the pill, change the physiology of women that cause them to be attracted to different men than they would otherwise, and men respond differently to women who are on contraception. It, it, and this stuff wasn't known until starting until the late 1990s. It's much more known now, and even feminists are speaking about this and writing about it. But um, it wasn't something that it seemed to me that was known at the time that the pill was invented. Um, the pill really did hit the world uh, like a bomb. Um, this was the 50th anniversary uh, issue of Time Magazine that says so small, so powerful, and so misunderstood. Uh, again, I think it was mis it's misunderstood in the sense that the world thought it was gonna be one of the greatest invent inventions of mankind ever um, and do the world an enormous amount of good where I think we're more and more realizing, still slow to realize it, but realizing how bad it has been um, for the culture. I mean, these we think cars are great, all sorts of meds are great, airplanes are great, computers are great. And we think you, the pill goes rates right up there with outstanding uh, things in the modern world. The expectations of the pill were that it would ensure sexual freedom, it would advance happiness. It would result in fewer unwed pregnancies. There'd be fewer abortions. There'd be better marriages uh, because you could test many partners before you got married. You could cohabit and test out a relationship and you could have sex without the fear of pregnancy. And pregnancy was, was portrayed a lot of time as something that was a frightening prospect rather than something that adults um, should be very eager um, to enter into. And then, of course, there was the expectation that it would control um, overpopulation. In my talk on contraception, why not? I, I go through each one of these and show all sorts of statistics, etc., that show that none of those expectations um, came to fruition. Paul VI in Humanae Vitae made four very general um, predictions. He said there would be a general lowering, lowering of morality uh, again, I could I could talk for hours on on that. Uh, 
I, I was born in 1950 and oh, just the, the peace that was sort of in the culture. I, I grew up in a small town. I could go any, at, from about the age of seven, I was allowed to ride my bike anywhere in the town. Um, you didn't have, we didn't lock our doors. We didn't have fear of anybody. Um, we thought that if, again, if I was ever unsafe, I could almost felt unsafe. I could knock on the door of almost anybody in the whole town um, and feel confident I could be taken care of. Uh, people lived at a pretty high level of uh, general morality. People were honest and trustworthy, uh, respected authority, uh, all sorts of things. Not every every time period has its own problems without a question. But if you just look at a certain general morality, it's definitely lowered. Um, less respect for women. Oh my gosh. And all the pornography, all the immodesty and dress. And one of the things which was amazing in Uganda is I almost saw, except for a few women who could not help showing off their beautiful curves, there was almost no immodesty um, in Uganda. There was no excess flesh shown. Um, it was really remarkable. Um, and the men, they all dressed well. They were their clothes were clean, they were well-pressed. Um, and it was it, it kind of the, the contrast between how some of them live in very dismal circumstances and how they turn themselves out um, for what they do during the day is, is stunning. So you look at our culture now and um, talk about less respect for women in, in respect of pornography, abandonment, um, uh, just the expectation that every woman is supposed to be a, a, a sex, wants to be, wants to be a, a sex object and presents herself um, as that uh, and how sad that is. Coercive control by governments over sexuality. Um, again, I was just in Uganda and they don't really have a problem with homosexuality there, um, but they are getting one because the NGOs are coming in promoting um, actually homosexuality by paying boys to have sex uh, and paying paying their tuition in schools so that they can infiltrate um, the culture. And then of course, if several um, national, um, international organizations that give aid to third world countries have ceased giving it um, to Uganda because they won't go along with their um, agenda for promoting um, illicit, immoral sexuality. And then we would treat the view that we would treat our bodies like machines. Now in the 1960s, there wasn't yet anything like IVF um, and there wasn't anything uh, like transgenderism, but those are clearly um, offshoots of uh, the contraceptive pill where we treat our body as something that we can just turn on and off our fertility. I think we would think God made a mistake because he didn't give us a little um, little a lever of some kind that we could be fertile when we want to be and turn it off when we don't want to be. Uh, and uh, we much prefer to think of our bodies as machines that we can shape to be whatever we want them to be rather than gifts as they are, as the bishop said in his opening beautiful little opening remarks that we need to accept ourselves. The catechism says we need to accept our gender. We need to accept what God has given us and how he's made us. <laughs> As I get older, I would say one of my mantras um, that stands me in good stead, which I wish I would have had from my earliest days, is that God's will is always better than my will. Um, and if I have a fight with God, I want him to win. Uh, that it, it's it makes life a whole lot easier when you when you realize that. So these are the real life consequences of contraception. They've been very bad for male female relationships. Women are used and um, discarded with just the most incredible um, liberty by by men. It's not been for good for men either. I mean, women don't seem to want highly disciplined men. They think that there's something wrong with them if they're not jumping on them. Uh, on the first date. You all, you know as well as I do what the bad health effects are for contraception. As I said, many modern feminists are catching on to that and writing books about it and saying we haven't really realized what 
uh, the chemical contraceptives do to our bodies. Without doubt, it facilitates sex outside of marriage. <laughs> that was one of my messages for the young men in Uganda, the seminarians. I mean, it, you know, they don't have a good record on chastity among the priests um, in Uganda. Um, and But they're very, very hostile uh, to homosexuality. And I said, you know, I, and they, they despise it. Um, they see it as an abomination and depraved. And I say to my problem in the United States is I have to convince people that homosexuality is wrong. I said, in Uganda, I have to convince people that they need to be compassionate um, to those who experience same-sex attraction. But they couldn't see why you should be compassionate. And I said, well, I said, it is a, a terribly unnatural sin, but fornication is a very serious sin for the damage that it does to everybody that's involved. I said, you know, you, how many babies are born out of wedlock because of fornication? How many women are abandoned? How many men become irresponsible? And I said, I, I think in certain ways you could say it's a more serious sin. And they're all kind of, they're slinking down in their seats and looking mighty uncomfortable when I'm um, making this, uh, this claim. Uh, fatherlessness, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, it increases the incidence of sexually transmitted diseases. They say one out of five Americans, and that includes infants and the elderly has an incurable sexually transmitted disease. I just can't imagine that, um, that for the rest of their lives, these people are gonna be looking for an outbreak and worrying about having sex when at different times because of um, an, S an STD. There's some commercials I've been seen on TV that talks about you know, different treatments you can have, but it says, well, we, we abstain whenever there's an, an outbreak, a couple will say. And I say, wow, if you can abstain for that, why couldn't you abstain, you know, using NFP or abstain before marriage? Okay, and obviously it leads to unwanted pregnancy and single parenthood, causes and leads to abortion, contributes to divorce, contributes to poverty and social chaos, is harmful to the environment, and paves the way for same-sex unions. I have a whole talk on why green sex is best, um, trying to make an argument that contraception is so bad for the environment uh, that um, environmentalists should be opposed uh, to contraception. I gave it in, I um, can't remember, the Boulder, Colorado once, and I had so much fun throughout my talk addressing the audience as my green friends. <laughs> I'd say, listen, my green friends, I'm sure since you care about the environment, um, you wouldn't want to have so many estrogens put in the environment that, that come through contraceptives. But I want to say in a sense, and maybe I'm uh, exaggerating things, but I'm, I'm going to forgive myself because I'm close. Um, I think it's pretty much changed everything. It's changed how we think about sex, <clears throat> how we think about babies, how we think about marriage, how we think about the body, how we think about homosexuality how we think about transgenderism and how we think about reality. It's just, it's been a, it really has been a bomb that has just, just shattered uh, the world in which we live. My dad, um, his, his cohort, he died about 10 years ago. He'd be in his, he'd be probably a hundred by now, maybe older. His cohort of, of men, Something that if the studies are worth anything, they say that men of his cohort, 85% of them were virgins when they got married. Can you imagine what uh, that would do for a culture if people were virgins before they got married? A major thing was, again, if they had, if they had sex before marriage, they very much expected a pregnancy as a, a, a result and more or less made... Um, you know, kept that in mind <laughs> that they shouldn't be having sex with anybody they weren't prepared to have babies um, with. I'm going to talk about all of these things, weaving it in and out through the talk. But what has happened is that the really the unthinkable has become the norm. And when I was in Uganda, the young I was told that people in Uganda think virtually everybody in the United States is gay. They're they're they just that's all they see on TV is homosexuality, sitcoms about homosexuality, commercials with homosexuals, they, you know, lawsuits about homosexuals, everything's about homosexuality. And I said, you know, there's something, <laughs> we're not all homosexual, but it is true that it's a dominant 
issue in our culture. They don't think about it at all. I would ask them, how many homosexuals do you think there are? They say, we have no idea. We don't talk about sex. Um, what, do you, what do you think might be the cause of homosexuality? We don't know. We don't talk about sex. It was, it was just amazing to me. And I said, well, we're obsessed with it. Um, and we're obsessed because it's in our face all the time. Um, let's see, I forget exactly how I was weaving this into this, but it's very important that the U.S. has more children that live in single parent households than any other country in the world, right? We have 23% of our children under 18 in single parent households. And if I wanna look at one um, reason for the um, decay of our culture, if I had to reduce it to one, it might be this one. Um, in Kenya here, it says it's 16%, it's right next to Uganda, um, and uh, that which has, so it doesn't tell us what theirs is, but it's under ours for sure. The global average is, is just about 7% of children under 18 live in single parent households. I said, you never want to get there. You, you, you want to reduce it, not increase it, because this causes the most incredible amount of uh, distress in a culture that children do not live with um, both parents. Then I think contraception is majorly behind that. Um, what's going on here? Okay, these are the kind of pictures I showed them, which shock them, all right? It shocks them to see a, a female priestess marrying two men, a Jesuit uh, priest blessing a married same-sex culture. And, and that looks to them, that looks as decadent as anything can look at. In our culture, it started to look like the norm. It's just, oh yeah, two people getting, two guys getting married, two guys getting blessed by a, a priest. Here you have two guys um, adopting babies who will never have a mother. Right? It's for them. It, it, this turns their stomach. Uh, they have still terrific co-natural responses to things. Again, we've been conditioned to now think that oh, isn't that sweet? Two men who love each other are able to raise a family. Um, gay parades, gay parades at which children attend. And that these men aren't arrested for um, indecent uh, exposure and the parents aren't arrested for child abuse. It's become acceptable in our culture. And then we have this, government officials um, who are transgendered. I, I don't think I'd heard the word transgendered until about 20 years ago. And at the time I thought it, <laughs> it's gotta be just most, most fringe, bizarre thing that anybody's ever thought about it. It's never going to be a part of a culture. Um, uh, it is, no. And we have um, Caitlyn Jenner and we have men in women's sports. Uh, I believe all of this can be traced back to contraception because it says contraception basically is saying I can remake my body. My fertility, I find to be a, a deficit. And so if I want to um, mess with that, um, alter it, I can. And for a female, that basically means having sex on a male's terms, sex on a terms where there won't be a baby involved. And so it, it changes um, our entire image of ourselves. And we've got... I remember when I first started talking about premarital sex a zillion years ago, I, I could easily say that the, the purpose of sex is to express love. And you don't, you, you know, the only loving thing is to have sex within marriage. And, and students pretty much got that. Young people, they, they got that it had something to do with love. Now when I would say things like sex um, is an expression of love, they kind of look at me, it's like, where'd you get that idea? You know, where'd you get that idea? Sex is just for pleasure. And you say, no, 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 no. Sex is for um, a commitment between a man and a woman that is welcoming to babies. I say, babies? What are you talking about there? Um, that's an option. Uh, it's not inherent in the very act itself. It doesn't define the act. We have control over that. And so the connection between sex and babies has been absolutely um, separated which in a sense separates us from our own bodies. Say, I can make my body be how I want it to be. And so if I prefer to be a male, 
Um, there's no reason I can't hack away at my body and take whatever hormones I want because we're taking hormones to prevent fertility. So why can't I take hormones simply to change my sex if I want to? The logic is really on the side of um, the transgender movement. That is once you say that contraception is an acceptable act, you have to look at all the assumptions that are behind it. And the assumptions that are behind it is that being fertile is a defect and we can use so-called medicine or surgery or whatever to change that defect as opposed of course to the church that understands um uh sexuality to be a great gift and the connection between sex and babies to be just a stunning uh connection that, and privilege that god has given us so I, I, I showed them this chart, um, which sort of reinforced their view about us all being gay, but it, it shows that, you know, um, in earlier generations, 1945, et cetera, um, homosexuality was under 2% of the population, right? And it, it's still the truth, those people are still today, it's still just 2% of those people. And then it, it started going up with the millennials. Those who were born in 1980, it was over 5% identified as homosexual. And now we have the um, Generation Z that was born in 1997. And now 20.8 in 2020, 2021, almost 20%. But now in 2023, 24, it says that 23% of, of young people in this generation identify as LGBTQ. That's insane. They can't all be <laughs> homosexual or transgendered. Something else is going on. But what a number, almost a quarter of a, of a cohort is identifying as LGBTQ. And we have to ask why. Why is it that they're, um, that they're doing this? And I think it's a profound unhappiness with life and thinking that if they could change their gender they might be happier. Um, feeling alone, isolated, not cared for, getting some attention if they identify. There's gotta be a lot of reasons, but none of them are good. All right. Um, growing acceptance of same-sex marriages. Uh, this is down in, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't show. I think it's 2012 right here that says that some, I don't know what happens, what, uh, says that, um, 27% of the people then accepted same-sex marriages. I'm sure 20 years earlier, it had to be under um, 10%. And now 71% of people uh, approve of same-sex marriages. Huh. I, I mean, you if you'd asked me 40 years ago, 20 years ago, I said, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Americans understand that you can't have two men or two women marry each other. We, we understand that. And for a while, it was just the courts that were changing it. Any reprimandum um, uh, put before the, the um, plebiscite failed. Uh, but then all of a sudden, with successful propaganda in the media, TV shows, et cetera, um, Americans became accepting of same-sex uh, marriages. Again, same-sex relationships are very much acceptance of them is very much a result of the acceptance of contraception. If sex is just for pleasure, um, which is what using contraception conveys, if it's just for pleasure, why not between two men, two women, three women, one man, two woman, women, why not if it's just for pleasure? And so it it corrodes our whole understanding of, of reality. We We take one thing, the contraceptive pill and what has altered so many things and then say if this is okay then this and that and that is okay that's actually pretty darn good reasoning that's how we reason in this world we we look at things and we say if this is wrong then that's wrong if this is right then that's right and so if contraception is right it's really hard to hold the line up uh, against a whole other set of um i would say uh, perversities all right, I, I could talk forever about population control. I, I got interested in it when I first started looking at the pill in the uh, 80s and 90s and seeing, you know, the world everywhere, world's overpopulated, people are going to be falling off the globe. It's a horrible thing. And if you're paying attention, uh, we see all the time that there's now a concern about declining population. Um, 
One of them is Elon Musk. It's a big theme with him pushing the fact that the um, we have an, a population implosion rather than a population explosion. There's this whole group of billionaires, a billionaire club now that meets with some regularity to discuss depopulation. Um, I don't quite understand why billionaires are bothered by a large population. They got everything they want. There's just no way that any poor person threatens their well-being. They make their money off of selling things usually, and the more people there are, the more things they could sell. But it's this worship of the environment now, it seems to me. And they think every human being is somehow a threat to the environment, climate change, et cetera. So we need to have fewer people. So I, I hate to say how many things um, that the elite have been pushing for the last 30, 40 years are being pushed by billionaires who are really, really want um, to, to uh, reduce the population. And they are being incredibly successful. Um, this is the annual world population growth rate between 1950 and projected through 2100. We had a huge leap of population um, that peaked in, in 1962 and 1963, the growth rate, not the population, but the growth rate. And this is how the growth rate is going down. The population is still increasing because of the number of people born between 1950 and 2000. But since that number is going down all the time, there are definitely places now that are not reproducing themselves um, as far as the population is concerned. Um, this, this chart shows that, that between 1950 and 2050, you have this steady increase in population up to about 9 billion. Though when I started this work back in the 1980s or so, they said we were going to get to 9 billion in the year 2000, all right? So it certainly hasn't done, done that. But here's the growth rate that goes down all the time. And there's very few countries in the world that have reversed a, um, a growing uh, uh, growth, I mean, a declining growth rate. I love these charts. I hope they're not too confusing, but this is a very healthy population growth pyramid. Um, these exam these aren't really, these are wrong, these names here, but forget those. And this, this shows a lot of babies being born. And of course, 10 years after those, this cohort, when it reaches here, it's gonna be smaller because some, some of those people die and some of those people die and some of those people die. And so this group that was kind of this big when we were all born together, by the time we read 80, there's not many of us left. But it's a beautiful picture because there's lots of consumers coming up. There's lots of people in the middle that have jobs and can take care of these people and can take care of those people. This is a slowing growth where there's fewer people being born. Again, it's still the proportionate more being born than are, are um, uh, uh, dying. And so you, you it's, it's slowing. Um, Zero growth means that, again, this, this group is just going to get smaller every year, all right? And every group gets smaller. Every group gets smaller every year to the point where at a certain point, when very few people are born, instead of here we have this group is born and the next group is smaller. Here, this group was bigger at the bottom. And then the ones beneath them, again, this one, okay, this one was probably this size when it started, this, this cohort and it gets smaller every year. But after them came a smaller group and after them comes a smaller group and a smaller group and a smaller group. So these are just gonna keep getting smaller. And there comes a time when um, there's more people in the older age group than in, sorry about this. I think I'm, okay. There's, there's um, this group is complete, this is the sandwich group that has the elderly to take care of and has the upcoming to take care of. And they're kind of really stuck in between. And it's just going to get worse and worse. Um, this is Italy. All right. They're not having very many children. They had a bunch of children, you know, 50 years ago. So they're still up here. Um, but before long, these are just, again, get smaller and smaller all the way up. Italy has only like one point 
two um, population replacement rate, and it takes 2.2 uh, children for a family to reproduce a population. So Italy's a dying country. If you go there, you'll see empty um, villages all over the place. They'll give you a house in many of these villages uh, in Italy. So in a sense, uh, we, we have a dismal picture. And the question is, what, are, what am I looking at and how did I get here? Remember, Archie Bunker says, I don't see no miracle in how we got here. Here was where we was headed. And I think it's true. If we had really understood the impact that contraception would have, we wouldn't be surprised that we've accepted homosexual marriages and we have transgendered um, children and we're not reproducing our population. It all follows extremely logically from contraception. John Paul II uh, encyclical Evangelium Vitae is written to get at the roots of the, what he calls the culture of death that we are into up to our ears. It's a very philosophical document, really worth uh, reading, reading slowly and carefully. And he, he, he's penetrated the whole thing. Um, he makes distinctions between the modern view of man. And the modern view of man is that we're all skeptics. We don't think knowledge is possible. Um, we're relativists. There's no moral absolutes. Um, you have your views and I have my views and there's absolutely no way to adjudicate the differences um, between us. You think homosexuality is wrong. You think abortion's wrong. Someone else thinks they're okay. There's no way uh, to have a debate about that. It's just your view against someone else's view. We all value the individual um, to the absolute supreme. We cannot force, well, we, we contradict this position all the time, but our initial position is Every individual can make up their own mind about anything and nobody can tell them what to do, all right? Um, we don't have any sense of the common good. That was very interesting to me in Uganda. They, they don't even know, they hardly know what the word lonely means, all right? They are all so embedded in family groups that if we, we say, oh, Americans have a problem with loneliness, they kind of look at you like, what does that mean? You know, don't you have families? Don't you have this? And we thought, we don't, we don't. They don't live near us. They live somewhere else. So, or we all disagree. Our brothers and sisters have totally different values. And even if they live next door, we might not be talking to each other. So they don't, and, and you like this. I have to tell this story, but they told me that um, they look out for people all the time. So that cliche that it takes a village um, to raise a child is definitely followed in Uganda, that they will discipline any child who is not behaving, even if they don't know the parents, all right? Um, they'll just step right in and, and do something. They'll step right in when other people, adults are doing something wrong and they have no hesitation telling them you're not behaving well. Well, at funerals, evidently, if someone's lived in another part of the country um, and all his friends come from that, or family come from that part of the country to the funeral, someone will stand right beside the priest when he's giving out communion at the funeral mass and say, don't give it to this man because he's an adulterer. Don't give it to this person because they're doing this, <laughs> okay? So they monitor who gets to receive communion um, by judging each other. Again, we've become pleasure seekers. That seems to be that their highest goal is not meaning, but the most beautiful house, the most beautiful vocations, the most beautiful clothes, because they all give us great pleasure. And we're consumers. We, we, we shop, 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 and we want bargains, and we take such pride. Probably take more pride in a bargain than almost anything else. So our highest value is now is what's called autonomy. Autos means self, and nomos means law. And it means nobody tells me what to do but me. Um, I'm a law unto myself. That's what the phrase means. But this is an amazing little picture. This little boy saying, I didn't choose to be born. And that's kind of the issue, the, the stature now of young people. I didn't choose to be born. I didn't want to be born. And so I'm miserable. So you need to give me whatever I want because I didn't choose to be born. And so if I want to be a male, you need to pay for the hormones and the surgery that I could change myself into a male because I didn't choose um, to be born. You owe me everything, right? So this whole notion of entitlement, meaning you have to give me an education, you have to give me housing, you have to give me everything, sex change, because I didn't choose to be born. And whether you have this idea, our bodies are ours to do with whatever we want. This notion that the church has 
that your body is a gift from God. Your gender is a gift from God. And you need to accept that. And you need to live your life in accord with the way that God made the body. It's like, what are you talking about? The culture is saying, what are you talking about? If anything's mine, my body is mine. And if there's anything I can do anything I want to with, it should be my body. Um, and, you know, I mean, we're pushing more and more euthanasia. Uh, people are going to have elective euthanasia whenever they want because they have no obligations to other people. If they want to die, the culture should make it easy for them. The Christian view of man, of course, is that Christ reveals man to himself. So if we want to know who we are and what we're meant to be in this world, we need to look at Jesus. He's a teacher. He's a reconciler and a healer. He's an obedient son. He's a just judge and a peacemaker. He's a lover and a self-giver. So unlike the modern person who says, I get to define who I am, and we're very confused about that. We don't know what, I don't, you know, if I were just say, okay, what do I want to be? I don't know. I don't know what that would be, honestly. And they're all confused. They don't have any idea what they want to be. A Christian doesn't have that problem. We know what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to put on Christ. And Christ shows us what we're supposed to be. It gives us a nice little agenda for our life. How am I making progress in being these things? Whereas the non-believer has no um, criteria by which to determine whether they are making progress or not progress because they define themselves for themselves. Other Christian values are truth. Truth. You start saying the word truth and people just say, there's no such thing as truth. All there is is opinion. You know, you say truth, but that's your truth, not my truth. So we can't, again, we can't argue things out. We can't say, okay, we disagree. Let's find a way to figure out who's right and who's wrong. Or maybe we're both wrong. Let's find out. You don't hear those conversations. Nobody, nobody has those conversations. It's all, um, I'll, I want you to respect my views. I want you to respect my opinions. We value God and religion. We value life. We value family. We want prosperity for all and we want peace. The basic Christian attitude, instead of saying, you know, I didn't choose to be born, you owe me everything. We have one little baby with um, two sets of grandparents and also parents, of course. And all of those people are just blotto about that kid and are trying to do everything for that child. But the point is that child comes in to the world embedded in relationships and that child is virtually indebted for the rest of her life everything that's done for us everything that's everything's been given to us everything and so for us to say everybody owes me everything as opposed to saying i i owe a great deal to my mother i owe a great deal to my father i owe a great deal to the culture to the government to the church because it's made things possible that i couldn't do on my own you don't hear that kind of thinking anymore ever all right the Christian community is based on love and sacrifice. This is some former students of mine. They're all grown now. These kids are all grown. But they had several of their own, and they've adopted um, two children. Emily here was my goddaughter. She has cerebral palsy. They've since adopted another very handicapped boy. But that's part of their Christian commitment. We're reaching out um, to those who are needy. And yes, it's a huge sacrifice but we're going to take care of it. So God is love and whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. So the modern values are again, very different. A modern view that um, man is sovereign over all. Um, again, there's no God um, in, in individual man. I mean, I can rule myself and uh, I, I need to. Suffering is useless. Uh, suffering is something that is a failure. And if you're suffering, it's obviously you haven't managed your life well. Uh, and other people need to rescue you from your suffering. We, the modern world doesn't believe there's life after death. Um, I, was, I went for just a little physical therapy for aches and pains today. And I was giving this little woman, this little young woman, a lecture about the challenges of old age. And she said something like, well, it's better than the alternative. And I said, I'm not at all sure. You know, and she could she was shocked. I said, you know, I'm not all sure. I mean, you know, death I'll be with Jesus. So what's better than that? Um, I got I got a lot to make up for, a lot of penance to do, a lot of service to do. I want to stick around, but I'm certainly not saying that um what's the alternative? <laughs> the alternative is I hope being with Jesus for an eternity. 
Christian truth is that God is sovereign over all. This is God's world. We want to discover God's will because, again, God's will is better than our will. So we, we are not going to try to impose our will on God. We want to know what his is and to do it. We believe that suffering has redemptive value and that we should we should accept uh, suffering graciously, but we should also sometimes seek it um, through penance and all sorts of things because good can um, good can come out of that. And we believe man has an eternal destiny with God. We don't have to get everything, all of our needs satisfied, our wants satisfied in this world because we don't believe this is the end of things. It makes us very relaxed if you haven't been to this part of the world, if we don't have our favorite automobile, we didn't do this. Who the heck cares, all right? Okay, in Evangelium Vitae, um, John Paul II, he's seeking the deepest roots of the struggle between the culture of life, Christian view of the world, and the culture of death, in which we live now. We cannot restrict ourselves to the perverse notion of freedom. It's not just autonomy. It's not just I can do whatever I want with my body. It's not just relativism. He says we have to go to the heart of the tragedy, excuse me, being experienced by modern man. The eclipse of the sense of God and of man. We no longer have accurate views of God and man. Um, my The young men I spoke to in Uganda were shocked that we can hardly say in the public square, God disapproves of homosexuality. Say so We can't say that. That would look, make God look bad, number one. Number two, who cares what God thinks? Um, our culture doesn't. Um, they couldn't believe that. They would say, that's where you start. You start with what God teaches about things. So in our culture, we think man is just a more highly developed animal. I got this from a children's book that all of us, this little baby was um, evolved from, I did see some baboons when I was in Uganda, but we came from a, a mammal, maybe a rat that became um, a, a monkey or baboon or chimpanzee and eventually became a human being. So we treat human beings like animal because we think he is an animal. That's our scientific view of things. Again, where the, the Christian view is that um, man's an immortal creature and God gave each human being a soul, made in the image and likeness of God. We'll treat people enormously differently if we think that every creature was, every human being was made by God to be with him for an eternity. This is, a, I got this 30 some years ago in um, the Philippines on a wonderful uh, presentation they were doing all over the country, uh, trying to uh, uh, work against um, contraception. But that the sperm does not have an immortal soul and the egg does not have an immortal soul. Only God can create an immortal soul. And that when a man and wife, a man and a woman, we hope a husband and a wife are having sexual intercourse, especially during the fertile time, they're essentially sending an invitation to God to create a new human soul. And this is an extraordinary thing that human beings could participate in the process of bringing into existence something that did not exist before and will always exist. So instead of seeing sex as just a momentary act of pleasure, mostly selfish pleasure, the church sees every act of sexual intercourse as a participation in God's um, creative um, work. We need to rediscover the value of sexuality and the connection with life. And that's precisely what contraception has, um, has caused us to forget. Again, what does having sex have to do with having babies? What does having sex have to do with love? What does having sex have to do with marriage, all right? Uh, contraception has, has severed all of those very natural, very commonsensical connections. But young people are surprised when you make these claims. Where'd you get that idea? Where'd you get that idea? Okay, well, a great work is John Paul II's Carol Boy T was, he wrote this before he was the Pope, Love and Responsibility. And he gives the best explanation of natural law, understanding of sexuality, of anyone. I'm just going to do the briefest of explanations here. Again, it, his whole, 
we learn the, the purpose of human sexual intercourse. I, this is from scripture, but he kind of makes it a philosophical truth. It's not good that man should be alone, right? Um, we all are, are destined to be in community and it's not good. It's not good that man should be alone. So God made a female. So the first reason for a female is that male and female need companionship. Um, otherwise they're just left with all the animals who can't talk to them, who can't relate to them, etc. To become one. Uh, it's not just that you shake hands, but you physically become one and you become one in such a way that you can create new human beings. You can be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. We were given that command. Again, people think, oh, the world's overpopulated. You can't say that, that's not right. God, and I would say, do you think God didn't know uh, that there would be a, a need for support for billions of people? I think he didn't know that when he gave us that command. I mean, and the fact is we have more food per capita now than we've ever had in the history of mankind, right? They, they, we're not running out of food. We've got plenty of food. The, the problem is, uh, uh, again, vicious governments. Um, Uganda is a very beautiful country. It's uh, luscious, it's lush, it's tropical. Uh, it's green everywhere. Things grow, just grow, they grow, grow, grow. And they have, you know, pick, oh, the mangoes. I would go back just for the mangoes. I've never had such a fresh mango as I had in, in um, Uganda. Bananas, um, tea, coffee, it's uh, sugar cane, it's all right there. They'd be a very wealthy nation if they didn't have a tyrant who taxes them to death um, and is an obstacle to any kind of economic growth. They even have oil, they have untapped resources of oil in Uganda. The people are hardworking, the people are honest. Um, the country could be wealthy, but they have a tyrant. So the problem isn't that there aren't resources, it's that human beings won't use those resources. And John Paul II says, it's absolutely wrong to use sex for other purposes. That's a biblical truth. So this is a beautiful statement from Love and Responsibility. When a man and woman capable of procreation uh, have intercourse, their union must be accompanied by awareness and willing acceptance of the possibility that I may become a father or I may become a mother. He says it's totally irresponsible to gauge in sexual intercourse without being aware that I could become a father, the man is thinking, or I could become a mother. To engage in, in that is like getting in a car and not paying any attention to whether the brakes are working. You say, excuse me, you step on the gas pedal, it goes forward. That's the nature of things. You engage in sexual intercourse, there might be a child that results. If you're not responsible, if you're not prepared to take care of that child, you have no business engaging in this act. It goes on to say, sexual union is raised to the level of the person only when it is accompanied in the mind and the will by acceptance of the possibility of parenthood. I mean, dogs and cats don't have it in, if you could call it a mind, but they don't have it in mind that they might become a parent, right? It's, they just act out of instinct. Well, persons don't just act out of instinct. Persons should know the nature of their actions and what kinds of consequences are likely because of this action and be prepared to accept those consequences. Again, contraception has destroyed that connection that if, if I wanted at one time to put, have a Sharpie on everybody, every young person's head or now every adult's head that says sex leads to babies, all right? Sex leads to babies. Keep that in mind. If you're gonna be having sex, just remember, sex leads to baby. Are you ready? Is she ready? Are you ready to become parents with each other? Otherwise, it's an animal act and not a personal act. He uses the phrase conscious parenthood, which appears in Humanae Vitae. It doesn't, it's translated not so well there, but what John Paul II means, that he means being aware that having sex leads to having babies. And he even uses a more important phrase, having sex leads to parenthood, right? Having sex leads to parenthood, not just a baby that shows up, but a baby for whom I'm responsible. A baby makes me a parent. And if I'm not prepared to ha have a baby, which means to be a parent, then I'm not prepared for sex. It's accepting and preparing for that consequence. That's what conscious parent is. I'm conscious that if I have sex, 
I might become a parent and I need to be prepared for that. What that means, accepting that consequence as good, right? It's saying, okay, that's not a bad thing. Sex leads to babies. It's good. It's a good thing for the child, the spouse, the society, and God. It's not like saying, oh, God made a big mistake um, joining sex to babies. Wasn't that stupid, all right? As opposed to, again, honoring God's um, way of doing things and saying, this is a good thing, and I need to accept this as good and not try to correct it and say God made a mistake, but say, no, this is a good thing. I'm going to live in accord with this reality. So you need to be ready to be a parent, and you need to choose a spouse who will be a good parent. It's so important to say a deal breaker. They use that phrase now, a deal breaker. What's a deal breaker in a relationship? Well, you know, if he smokes, I'm not marrying him. Okay, I'm pretty much with that. Some are, if he's vaccinated these days, I'm not marrying him. That's a new deal breaker. Um, you know, but anything, like like he uh, wants to spend Christmas with his parents, that's a deal breaker, whatever. But ours is, for John Paul II, it says, unless I think this individual that I'm attracted to and I want to have sex with, unless I'm convinced this person will be a good parent with me, right? Not necessarily you're saying, yeah, I see all the good qualities, but there's promise. There's real promise here. There's a foundation that the two of us could be good parents with each other. I had a, a, a former student of mine who, good Catholic, but she fell so in love with this man and was attracted to him at least and starting having sex with him. And then it was a very volatile relationship and she couldn't seem to break up with him at least permanently. And one day we were together and she said, the problem, she said, I'm crazy about him. She said, I don't think I'll ever find a man, man that I'm as crazy about as him. But I can't imagine him being the, the father of my children. She said, he's a lapsed Catholic. He hates the church. She said, I want my children raised Catholic. And I said, would you think about that for a while? <laughs> Write it down maybe 25, 50 times and see what conclusions you might draw from that um, insight that you don't that he wouldn't be a good parent for your children. She broke up with him and eventually married a wonderful man and has had a wonderful marriage. So there's also the sense that you don't inflict parenthood on someone who is not ready. One of my nephews was having, when he was 18, was having sex with a 16 year old. And I sat him down and I said, what are you gonna do if she becomes pregnant? Oh, she won't become pregnant. No, 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 she, we're using contraception. I said, well, I want you to know there's a lot of people in this very room we're in now that their parents didn't think they were gonna um, exist because they were using contraception and here they are now. She said, she's 16. Do you wanna get married? You're 18, she's 16. Do you want your child raised by a 16 year old? Do you want your child put up for adoption? Do you want your child aborted? You know, well, he stopped having sex with her. He figured it out, all right? But it was like, she's not ready and I'm not ready. And so we shouldn't be doing this, right? John Paul II uses this marvelous phrase, using the other. He says, if the possibility of parenthood is deliberately excluded from marital relations, the character of the relationship automatically changes. The change is away from unification in love and in the direction of, or rather bilateral enjoyment. That instead you're saying, I just want to engage in a, in a pleasurable act with you. I'm not prepared to have a child. So this is one of the little slides I use in my contraception, why not talk? It has a lot of effect on people. The contraceptive sex is simply sensuous. These two people are basically, um, have a powerful physical attraction to each other. They're faceless. They may not know each other's last name. Um, they probably will have sex within a couple hours and may have nothing to do with each other the next day. Con I'm sorry, contraceptive sex says, I want to have sex with you. That's it, period, stop. Non-contraceptive sex says, I want you to be the mother of my children. And I've actually had people say they've listened to my tape. And one, one woman said her fiance said, that's how he proposed. He said, I, he proposed by saying, I want you to be the mother of my children. Um, and what does that mean? That means a lifetime commitment with this person. Children require a lifetime uh, care of their parents. Having sex with someone is a very momentary action, has no, no you know, in, an, in and of itself, unless it's open to procreation, it's just a momentary thing. So I'm gonna quickly look at the deeper meaning of humane vitae. A key is this word munus. It actually launched me on my whole little um, defense of the church's teaching. 
I was reading Humana Vita and I encountered this word munis. Um, it's in the first line of Humana Vita. It's And I looked it up in the documents of Vatican II. And at the time there wasn't even a concordance. So I had to sort of put my face, my little eyes over every line of, of, of the documents of Vatican II, looking for the Latin word munis. You might know the word from it says that Christ is has the munis. He has the munis of being priest, prophet, and king. That's his role in the world. He is supposed to be the priest, he's the prophet, and he's the king. It's what God asked him to do. God sent him to be priest, prophet, and king. Mary, the documents of Vatican II, tell us that Mary has the munis of being the mother of God. That's what God has asked her to do. I want you to be the mother of the Savior. St. Peter and the apostles have the munis of binding and loosening. That's their job in the world. I depend, God depends upon the apostles and the, the successors of the apostles to bind and loose. The Pope has the munis of infallibility from 1846 to 1878. I just noticed that. Anyway, um, that's what he does in this world. A unique gift is he can teach infallibly. Bishops have the munis of teaching and preaching. The first line of Humanae Vitae speaks about a gravissimum munis that's possessed by spouses. Previous translations translate it this way. God has entrusted to spouses the very serious duty of transmitting human life. Gravissima munis is translated as very serious duty. Now, Americans don't like the idea of duties. We find them burdensome. Something, it's like taking out the trash or paying our income tax. It's not something that we find elevating. It's kind of a servile thing we need to do is to perform our duties. I think a better translation is God has entrusted to spouses the extremely important mission of transmitting human life, and then it continues, by which they offer a service to God. So if people were to think about sex as a means by which, marital sex, as a means by which they perform an extremely important, gravissimo, very weighty, um, munis, mission of transmitting human life by which they offer service to God. So various translations can be used for the word munis. It's a gift, it's a role or a task. Christ has the threefold munis of being priest, prophet, and king. Pope has the munis of infallibility. Mary has the munis of motherhood of God. Spouses have the munis of transmitting human life. It's a unique task entrusted to spouses whereby they provide a service to God. What is that service? God wants souls. He created the whole universe for souls. And he's decided, he made, as I always say, he made the first man from mud, and he made the first female from the rib of a rational creature. And after that, it was sexual intercourse. So he's said, I want my kingdom populated, but I want it populated between the love and a, of a male and a female who are committed to each other in marriage who will raise the children that result. I think the word mission might be the closest good translation. Gaudi Metspes talks about the munis of spouses. It says, in the duty, officium, of transmitting and educating human life, which is the special mission, missio of spouses, they understand themselves to be in cooperation with the love of God, the creator, and as it were, interpreters of this love. Therefore, with human and Christian responsibility, they will fulfill their munis, their task, their mission, right? We are cooperators with the love of God and interpreters of his love. The document Familiaris Consortio, or on the role of the family in the modern world, muneribus, muneribus, that's the plural of munis, concerning the muneribus of the Christian family. What are their tasks? Well, among others, Looking at it in such a way as to reach its very roots, we must say that the essence and role, munis, of the family are in the final analysis specified by love. Hence, the family has the mission to guard, reveal, and communicate love. And this is a living reflection of and a real sharing in God's love for humanity 
and the love of Christ the Lord for the church, his bride. Spouse, those young people falling in love, getting engaged, wanting to get married. Their goal has to be to create a loving family. That's their goal, right? A loving family. And they have to ask, can we do that? It's not just to have a companion to travel with or go to movies with or something or chill out with. It's to create a loving household. Ah, that's my mother and my father. Um, they eventually had six. This is me. I think I'm about three and a half or four um, at the time. This is probably 30, 40 years ago, the progeny of the six that they had. But they did a pretty good job of being fruitful and multiplying. Um, and uh, this is the ultimate goal is to create, to bring up our children uh, to be saintly and to be saints in heaven. And that's the goal. I don't know how many of my family is going to make it. I'm not sure I'm going to make it, but um, that's the goal. Okay. I brought that, I brought this flight in exactly in an hour. I'm so proud of myself. So I'm prepared for any questions anyone might have. Thank you. Um, I have this question that I know it will be asked and probably um, some people who did not hear contraception, why not, might be wondering about this. Like, what if they completed their family? What's wrong with contraception if they have like already four, five kids? How would you respond to those people who think that way that, OK, we were open to life. We have completed our family. What's right. wrong if we use contraception at this point? Well, again, it, co contraception, there's many ways of explaining it. Um, one is that, um, again, contraception, even the very word it, itself means against conception. All right. It's a very negative thing. Because I said earlier, it's treating your fertility as if it were a defect as opposed to a treasure. All right. And it's saying now I uh, we've been generous. We've had children. Now our fertility has become a threat to our happiness. And you wanna say, really? I mean, you might be right that it's not a good idea to have another child, but that should all be discerned with God. That should all be um, discerned through a prayerful communication with God. I recommend that spouses write a prayer and just say, God, it seems to us that more children would be an undue burden on this household, but we'd like to, we only wanna do your will. So please make your will known to us about this. Natural family planning always treats um, fertility as though it's a marvelous thing that should never be violated, all right? You're not trying to undo your fertility, you're honoring it. Um, you're not breaking it, you're not smashing it, you're not dishonoring it. You're saying, if again, there's, there's almost a sense that I mean, sex is a gift from God and he basically tells spouses they can have sex all month long, all right? But if they're going to have sex during that fertile period, again, he wants to be invited to the party, right? It's a party. And God said, I made this for you to be in love with each other, but also for give me an opportunity to create new human life. So if you're having sex during the fertile time, I'm taking that as an invitation that if I so choose to create a new human life at this time, I will. And you're not going to object to that because you know that that is the nature of this act. So there's, and, and then the, another big whole line of argumentation is that the act of sexual intercourse is unlike any other act of kissing or shaking hands or making a meal for someone, it really signifies and speaks, the meaning of it is that I make a complete gift of myself to you, like I make of myself to no one else. I don't engage, I have dinner with other people, I shake their hands, I do all sorts of things. I don't have sex with anyone else. And why is that? Because this act has, it, again, it, by its very nature, it's ordained to a new human being. A new human being who requires a mother and a father that is for the lifetime of that child and beyond, committed to each other. So it's not a trivial thing. It's a huge thing. So the very act itself, if it's not contraceptive, it says, I am open to a lifetime union with you. That's the very nature of this act. So that's why this act is the act that consummates a marriage. Why? Why would, why, you, you need, we need some act that brings the, the vows that you've said to fruition. 
why wasn't it enough just to to stand in front of God and say, um, I, I take you as my spouse for the rest of my life? Say, no, no, that's that's a, a what do they call it? A ratified marriage, but it's not yet a consummated marriage. And consummation means I'm bringing it to its fullness. And the fullness is when the, the spouses engage in an act of sexual intercourse open to children, because that's a very physical manifestation of their intention to be with each other, unconditionally loving, inseparable union for the rest of their lives. And so if you contracept, I mean, the sad thing is we found out it's true. You can have contraceptive sex with just about anybody. It's no big deal. That's why people do it. It's no big deal. But having non-contraceptive sex, I mean, I, I've seen men do this and they say, you know, at my workplace, the, my fellow male workers would tell me that there's no difference between using NFP or contracepting. We still want to have sex without having babies. And then he says, I challenge him. I said, well, why don't you just go home and make love to your wife tonight without a contraceptive? And they say, oh, that would be completely different. You say, in what way? Well, she might get pregnant. And what does that mean? That means that I'm, you know, we're in it for the long haul. I'm making a commitment that I'm not making when I'm contracepting, right? It's kind of a carefree action. Oh, just have a little bit of fun, a little bit of sex. The act of sexual intercourse, even so, it's, you know, it's certainly, it's always fun. It, it should always be fun. It should always be pleasurable. But when it has that meaning in it that you accept, we could become parents with each other. That's huge. I want to be, a, I'm willing to be a parent with you. To say that to another person is way different from saying, I find you attractive. I want to have a great pleasure with you. I want to have sex with you. Saying to this person, I'm willing to be a parent with you means I'm willing to have a lifetime commitment with you. And I'm doing something that could actually cause that to bring up, come about. So are you remembering anything else I said that you might want me to say? Thank you. No, thank you. Sister has her hand raised, so we can... Uh... Uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen so we can see you all big and uh, hold on. Um, I can. I can. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Sister Therese, thank you. Yes. Hi, Janet. Thank you so much for your lovely presentation. I actually remember seeing you in Australia over 15 years ago. Hi. Um, you had come to the Catholic Adult Education Center in Lidcombe, and this was before I became a sister. Oh, and you had a really nice beautiful story. presentation. <laughs> yes. Um, so I have two questions, Janet. Um, the first is, can you speak more to the idea of um, having a contraceptive mentality, even using NFP? Because um, a lot of people sometimes don't even realize that could be an issue. And then the second question is, especially for like non-practicing Catholics, um, say that video, that five minute video that Marie sh shared with us last uh, week that was kind of promoting your talk. Some people found it very offensive and um, we're, we're living in a very contracepting world. Um, people don't feel comfortable with this idea of abstaining and, you know, having self-discipline. So when it comes to people who are not really um, making it a priority to do God's will, how would you kind of explain this? And would you explain it differently or would you just still say the same thing and it's just up to them to accept or not? You're right. I mean, it, it, well, it's very difficult. Um, I mean, the, the, every audience requires a different approach, honestly, almost every individual, because you, you want to start building, I, say, I, I hate the phrase, but I'm going to use it. You have to meet them where they're at, all right? So you have to find out what their values are. Um, one thing that sometimes works, as I said, with this culture is, is not um, that we don't like to buy food that has is filled with chemicals, all right? We wanna eat very nutritious and natural things. So why would a woman put chemicals in her body day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year to avoid something that's totally natural and that if it does need to be avoided, can be avoided through natural means. And so, I mean, some people, I mean, you know people, I mean, they're all buying, you know, organic tomatoes, organic everything. Um, and, you know, say, well, shouldn't you be concerned about everything you put in your body and it's just, just in food? So that's, that's a start. Another thing um, 
I have found is that, especially when I was talking, it's not so much recently, I don't do that many talks anymore, but um, you know, I'd ask young people, especially high schoolers, I ask them, how many of you, um, this was more about why premarital sex is wrong, but it works into it. How many of you want to be faithful to your spouse through your whole life? All the hands go up. How many want your spouse to be faithful to you? All their hands go up. I said, well, why not start being faithful to your future spouse now? So that when you meet your future spouse, you can say, I knew you'd come along. I knew you'd be special. I I was waiting for you. I said, well, it's it's somewhat the same with, with um, contraception. And I'm trying to, I just lost my line of thought. But it's, um, again, you're, you're saying, I would never want to harm, especially the man to the woman. I, I, there was a Knights of Columbus group at one of the campuses where I spoke. They made up their own posters that were very provocative. And one of them was around campus to promote my talk. And one of the posters was, do men who, do, will men who love women let them use contraceptives? And it, men would just stop, people would just stop and look at that and think and think and think. What could that mean? You know, and saying, I had a priest friend who, when a couple came in with him to her premarital prep, he'd show them the insert that came with the contraceptive pill. And he'd make them read aloud the 33 counter indications. And then he would say um, to the young man, would you take something that does that to your body? And she's looking at him, she's looking at him, you know, and he says, no. And he said, well, then why would you, why would you let her uh, take this? So there's the sense of protectiveness that you want to have to your um, your your spouse or your future spouse, and not put them at certain dangers. Um, so, yeah, you have to start at all sorts of different um, places with them. Oh, yeah, I know where I was going. I will also ask young people. Um, I can you can count on you can count on the fact that young people hate divorce. Or they hate it. Either they've grown up in divorced households or their friends have. And they know the chaos that it creates, the heartbreak, everything. All I have to say is, do you know that um, contracepting couples divorce somewhere between 50 and 65% of the time? Um, those who have sex before marriage, in which they're all contracepting, they have a very high divorce rate. Couples who use natural family planning, so far as we can tell, it's around 2%. I said, double that, make it 4%. I said, double that, make it 8%. Double that, just keep doubling. I said, it's going to be a long time before you get to 50 or 60%. I said, if, if you want to have a long lasting marriage, there's several things that will help, many things. But this one isn't just the act of abstaining. Again, it, it's, it's a whole commitment that's written into natural family planning. You have to talk about it. You have to communicate. You have to... Um, talk about how many children you're going to have and when you're going to have them. You have to talk about how important sex is in your life. Why are you abstaining or why are you not? All of these conversations are extremely important for building a relationship. People who are contracepting cannot talk about children for babies for years, you know, and they don't ever discover. And you, well, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to, I might want a baby, but I don't want to push him. I just, you're married for crying out loud. You've got to have these conversations. So I find that um, often I find most persuasive the sort of the environmental type thing. Why do this to your body? Um, and then second, and there's all those things. It, I, you know, I'm sure you're covering at some point about all the bad side effects of, of contraception. I mean, women get it. I mean, they know that they get migraines. They know that they gain weight. They know that they're depressed. And I'm saying, what the hell are you doing? If you're you, you're taking this in order to have sex, but it makes you miserable and not want to have sex. It reduces your libido. There's no there's no logic in in doing this. Um, and then saying that if you really want a long lasting marriage, which is what people want, they don't believe it's possible anymore. They just don't believe it's possible. They they figure before long they might well get divorced as opposed to going into the marriage and saying, I'm doing everything I can. I said, I have one nephew is abstaining. He's not, he's getting married. He's been with the same girl for seven years now. They haven't had sex. 
And, you know, I, I talked to him the other night. He wanted to say, what, hey, Janet, do you think about NFP? And I said, oh, my gosh, I'm not doing right by this boy. But, um, you know, I just said, can you, I, you can't yet imagine what a great gift the two of you have given to each other by remaining virgins before you're married and questioning whether contraception is right within marriage. I said, you're going to have such a strong marriage. It's going to be unbelievable. So... Thank you. Uh, yes. We have sister. Do you have another question? Thank you. That was really helpful. Uh, and the other part was regarding that contraceptive mentality when yes. it comes oh, to yes. NFT. Right. Yes. Right. Thank no, that's you for the I, reminder. I, yes. Well, yeah. Um, well, a contraceptive mentality, I think, is that I'm in control of how many children I have. All right. And it's not God's will; it's my will. And I'm just using NFP with basically the same mentality. It's like like NFP is healthier. Um, I, I prefer it, but really I'm deciding how many children I have. All right. And um, again, everything in our life should not be, I'm deciding what college I'm going to, I'm deciding which, which job I take. It should always be in discernment with God. And so NFP can be used with this contraceptive mentality. It's just a safer way of controlling my family size. But what you really want is to say, again, get to a point where you're saying, you know, whatever it is, you have three children, five and under, you have a elderly parent who has dementia you're taking care of, you have a handicapped child that receive, needs a lot of help, you have a spouse who doesn't have a job at the moment. You say, a child, I just don't know how I can meet all my, my current responsibilities and add another child into this picture. It's not selfish. It's I'm trying to meet all these other demands in my life. And then you say, but I want to ask God. And as I said, well, my recommendation to people is to use natural family planning if you think you've got a good reason, but keep asking God to make it clear to you and just say, if my reasons are selfish, please let me know. If you think we can handle another child, please make it happen. Um, you know, and how many people have you heard from that says, you know, they definitely didn't want one more. One more comes along and they say it's the best thing that ever happened to them. We simply don't know what's good for us. And that, that's what we have to keep keep understanding. Uh, the cure for it, though, I, and I'm sure there's some people that, that they're so set in their ways they can't really profit from this, what I hope is good advice, is that I think that... Um, NFP is kind of a cure for using NFP with a contraceptive mentality because um, it requires spouses with some regularity to discuss why they're not having a child. Because, you know, go on a vacation, you say, gee, we'd love to have sex this weekend, but you're fertile, you know? And, and so you're, it gets frustrating. And so you say, have a conversation. And that conversation makes you evaluate why did you make this decision in the first place? And if you say those reasons aloud, the reasons I the reason I didn't want to know the child is that um, I'm so glad the youngest is in kindergarten and I can do all of these things, et cetera, et cetera. And then you listen to it and say, hmm, maybe that's not a beautiful reason. You know, maybe, maybe that's selfish. So you have to try to be honest with yourself. And if you use NFP by trying to reassess have we made a good decision? I think you will work it out eventually. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. One question in the chat, Professor Smith. How do you address the couple who think NFP is wrong and that parents should have all the babies they could possibly have? <laughs> yeah. Uh, God bless them is what I say. Um, yeah. Well, the point is that God has given us um, knowledge about how to manage affairs. Again, that doesn't mean wholly on our own decision-making, I decide. God doesn't say, for instance, give away every all the money you get every month. Why not just give it away? Why not just say, God will provide, all right? Um, nobody does that. Everybody saves some money. Everybody tries to be prudent about their use of money. And you want to say, if you want, if God wants you to be prudent about money, I think he also wants you to be prudent about childbearing. That um, there's, you know, 
and I hate to say it, but a fair number of these couples, especially the husband, I have to say, does not want to abstain. And so he takes this position in order to um, not have to engage in uh, not to abstain. And I, I've recommended to the wives, you know, I just say, well, just lay out for him what is um, difficult about your life now. And say, if you get another, if you're going to have another pregnancy, you're going to need someone to clean the house. You're going to need someone to prepare meals a couple of nights a week. And if it's not him, he's going to have to pay for it because you've gotten to the point where you just can't do this. Um, and so, is that the question? Yeah. What was the question? Tell me again. Having so many kids, that NFP is wrong and they should have as many kids as possible. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, I had a friend who thought that. And after about s child six, she started deciding that no, um, they probably should do some planning. She eventually had eight and happy for all those children. One of the most generous souls I've ever met in my life. But at a certain point you say, I, I really don't think I can perform all the things that God wants me to do. Um, and it would be proper to have recourse to uh, NFP. If you're, if you say, no, God won't let me get pregnant um, unless it's good for me. I, that's like, I don't know. It's just like eating everything I want and saying, God won't make me fat unless he wants me to be fat. I'm saying, no, I'm doing stuff that will make me fat. So I'd have to, I have to live in accord with reality. So there's a way in which you're being presumptuous that God will rescue you from any of your bad choices. There's nothing, there's nothing in any of the literature anywhere in the, in the church that gives this suggestion that you should have as many children as your body can possibly bear. All of the stuff is, is there are times. And John Paul II actually, it, and it's logical that there are times when it's um, an obligation to limit your family size. He says that in love and responsibility. And if you don't, you're being irresponsible. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Mira, your hand is raised, and then Deacon George. Thank you. Uh, Mira, can you unmute, please? Yes. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, yes. I just wanted to quickly go over um, the statistics that you had um, provided regarding couples who are married and use contraception divorce rates. And and the ones who don't, because that was a, a huge discrepancy. And if you connect that to um, children who grow up in homes without the father active and present, and the likelihood of them, you know, going to prison and, and you know, um, committing crimes and hurting other people uh, is, is astronomical, the difference. Um, a huge percentage is there, too. And if you compare also to, um, you know, uh, households where the father is active in his faith and how much more likely the children are to be active in their faith if the father was present. Um, I mean, these are these are crazy, scary numbers. But I want to make sure I heard you right, because I heard somewhere between 50 and 65 and 2 percent. So I just wanted to confirm if that if that is there. There don't seem to be totally um, studies on. Uh, the relation NFP and divorce. Let's say there's all sorts of different studies, but everybody finds some sort of imperfection um, in them. Uh, couple to couple league will say something like um, two percent of their uh, couples have ever gotten uh, divorced. So as far as they're keeping keeping records, I have a friend who um, was on a marriage tribunal uh, and said he virtually had never had a couple using NFP coming um, asking for an annulment. I'm sure that's not true that there's never been such a person, but it's it's rare enough that it had never come up in all of his years of being um, a, a part of the tribunal for for a divorce. So I always try to, as I said, I try to take it to say, all right, some organizations from their records say it's around 2%. I said, suppose that's 100% wrong. All right, that would make it 4%. All right, suppose that's 100% wrong. What is that? What is that? 8% eight, 8%. Then you keep going, and it's going to be a long time before you get up to 50%. Now, even that 
they, they have a bizarre way of calculating that they've done for years that they take how many people get married this year, say it's 2 million and 1 million get divorced. That means the divorce rate is 50%, but it's not the same group of people. I mean, that this group just got married and this group may have been married for one year, 20 years, 40 years of those who got divorced, but it's the measure that the sociological world has decided to use, not me, right? So I'm using their stats, right? But most of us can, you know, you have to look around your life and just sort of look at what goes on. And it, it, for most people, they can say the couples who, again, NFP is not independent of generally being very religious, being very observant of, um, going to mass every Sunday, going to confession with regularity, receiving the sacraments, um, trying to live by the moral teachings of the church. It's not an isolated thing. It's a package deal with a whole bunch of other things. And you say, you do all those things, the chances, of, I, I'm, you know, we don't want to say just, I want. I don't want to say just NFP, but I would say you don't find very many people using NFP that don't have all those other elements in, in their marriage a life, whereas people who contracept may or may not go to church, may or may not live by the teachings of the church, which they're already not doing by contracepting, may or may not go to confession, may or may not talk about having children. Um, and so you just have to look at the different lifestyles that the two choices um, are involved in the two choices to see that one is much more likely to lead to a long lasting um, marriage than, than the other. You, you, numbers are, again, you look them up, they're all over the map. Thank you, Professor. Yes. Thank you, George. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, apologize for my appearance. I'm studying for an exam, comprehensive exam this weekend I have to take. Um, when you had the uh, question about uh, after you've had the children and what is the point of using NFP, uh, when there was one uh, thought that uh, I had come across when I was doing a discussion with some youth about uh, natural family planning and, and the understanding of the dignity of uh, sexuality and marriage. And, and it, this is just a thought. I've never really read it anywhere in uh, specifically, but what I came to uh, conclude in the meditation is that if the marriage, uh, whether or not it had children, but if it does have children, the uh, NFP, the practice of the NFP, if it strengthens still the marriage bond, it is both still unitive and procreative, whether or not there is a child that comes from it. This isn't quite the terms that we use in moral theology, that, that the, the act itself is still procreative, whether there's a child or not. But what I'm trying to say is that if there already is children, then what it does is it continues to enhance what has been uh, already gifted in the family with children. So it, in that sense, it's still creating, if you will, it's still sustaining what has been created. Uh, and it's and if there are not children in the marriage, it is still enhancing the marriage itself. It is creating it. It is still sustaining it. Now, we use the term unitive for that most of the time. Uh, in our moral theology, but I think, and this is a little view that I don't know if I can pinpoint it from any scholars and so forth, but it's almost as if the unitive and the procreative are simultaneously a single act. I think in our theology, we try to separate them too much rather no. than to see how closely united and how closely they are actually a singular act. Um, again, I know that in a some sense, this can be applied, but I thought just to help answer that question about what happens after you feel you've had enough of your kids and or had all of your kids. Um, the idea is, is that when the marriage falls apart in the marriage bed and there is a divorce, then look what happens to the kids. Look how much they suffer. But if the marriage bed is still taken care of faithfully and properly, look how much the kids benefit from it. So it's still helping the children is kind of my my it's point, I guess. Most of you believe me. I mean, um, divorce is more or less hell. And just, you know, financially for both of them, 
trying to manage relationships with <laughs> other family members, the children. It's horrible. There's a book by, um, who's it, Layla Miller, um, Primal Loss, which is a marvelous book on the effect of um, divorce. I mean, so many people say the kids can handle it. And it's so, it's baloney. Um, they are marked forever. And these are by adult, she has testimonies from adult people whose parents divorced when they were children and how much damage um, it's, it's done to them. But certainly Humani Vitae talks about the unitive and the procreative meaning of the sexual act being inseparable, all right? They cannot be separated. And that if you are, again, as I said, if you're engaging this act in order to have a child, at the same time, you're uniting because you're saying, I want to have a child with you, which means I'm going to be with you for the rest of our lives. If you're trying in union with a person and leaving the procreative possibility open, even though you're, you're not desiring at the moment, you're still saying, I'm willing to engage in an act with you that may result in children. So I'm still in this committed lifetime union with you. And when the very friend I was talking about that eventually had eight, she just always said, she said, I was, it just made me realize that when my husband and I um, were uh, using NFP, you know, obviously you're still seeing a kind of this openness to, to life. And she said, I just knew he was committed to me. She said, I knew that, that if one more child showed up, he was going to be there. And this was, he was always saying with his sexual acts, I'm not leaving. I'm here for the long haul. And she said, that's everything I wanted to know. That's what I wanted to know from him is that he's never leaving. So I think that that's the unitive sense is that I'm not, I'm not leaving. This is indissoluble. Um, I'm faithful and I'm never leaving. And you say, whoa. And you say, I'm saying that with my sexual acts by not cutting them off from the possibility of procreation because procreation creates in a sense, the necessity for any responsible human being to stick around. I mean, the irresponsible will leave, but anybody who has a sense of responsibility should be saying, well, I'm, I'm still, I'm here, I'm needed. I have obligations, I have responsibilities. So, but thank you. Thank you for the, those observations. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's about time for us to conclude. I just want to remind everyone, last week, uh, Anne gave us a talk about uh, fertility care, charting your cycles, benefit for your uh, health and your fertility. And this was this is one of NFP methods uh, that Dr. Janet Smith mentioned today, one of the natural family planning method. Next week, we will hear from Melissa Tablada benefits for your marriage from charting your cycle and also from Dr. Angela Kirsten, who is an Apple Technology Medical Consultant, who'll talk about it uh, for women's health and for treating gynecological problems and infertility. So we hope that uh, you will join us next week. And tonight's recording will be, I think by tomorrow morning, it will be on my YouTube channel and probably during the day, it'll be on the website. So you can access, you can share it with other people. I think we really um, have a lot to do to, um, make people realize that the root of this culture of death is contraception, not abortion. And if we want to really build a culture of life, we have to um, raise awareness of the harms of contraception, which led to abortion and to transgender and all what Professor Janet Smith mentioned today. So we have a lot of work to do, but we appreciate your presence here. And uh, we will continue to do whatever we can to raise awareness and to help people to be educated in this topic. Professor Smith, thank you so much. It was really a great uh, hearing your presentation tonight. And uh, I'm going to share uh, in an email other talks, Contraception, Why Not? I'll share the links for it with the people who registered so they can hear some of the other talks that you had given, which can help them understand even more why um, this is really not the way that God intended it for marriage. So uh, we really appreciate your presence. We thank everyone uh, who joined us tonight. And we hope to see many of you uh, even next week. I know it's a Tuesday of Holy Week, so some of you might have services in the Maronite parishes. Hopefully those who will be done will be able to join us at 8 o'clock. And thank you so much, and have a blessed evening, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. God bless all of you. Wonderful thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you.
everyone. Thank you. God bless everyone. And have a blessed Holy Week. Yes. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye now. Good night.